Welcome, welcome. Welcome. It's been too long. Gosh, have I missed you all. Missed the room, missed the whole concept. Missed being able to stand up vertical, all of that stuff, which we take for granted. Anyway, welcome. This is March 24th, uh, 2014. It is officially spring. As of a few days ago, we are official. And man, I don't know if it's just really the weather or just our attitude, but it is wonderful. I just absolutely love spring. I am so excited for that cold stuff to be out of here. I don't care how hot it's going to get this summer. <laughs> you have to remind me I said that. But we are really excited. It's spring. It just brings out all of our mojo. Anyway, welcome, welcome. Um, we have a traditional format. We have lots of new people, you guys. We actually, I'm going to update you a little bit on our PBS stations. We have over 40 stations now airing the PBS show. Um, we have them being picked up every week. We have over 11 million households that we are um, telecast broadcasting to this particular show. Um, we are, you know, planning the second series now, which will film the end of April. You know, it's actually working. <laughs> it's actually was supposed to work, but it really, you know, we did all that so long ago, it, you kind of wonder what's going on. But it actually is working, and we're very excited. We have an upcoming um, PBS, It's a Stitch, which is another show that I did some filming on, coming up this week. But we'll send out an email and let you all know, because for a while on the It's So Easy um, TV, or... or it's so easy tv.com on their website you can watch the show they have it up for like seven days and we'll um, we don't have that series so the only way for you to really be exposed to that is to watch that on their website so we'll send out an email and let you all know when that is and when it will air from start two to end two um, but what I, the reason I was saying this is we've picked up a lot of new customers through the PBS series who have uh, known now about our webcast, which was the goal, was to bring everyone to the Silhouette Pattern website. And so that is working. That's the good news. And um, our goal is to just gain as much exposure as we can. Obviously, there's good news and bad news to doing that, but we're appreciative that you all are here and that we are growing. So thank you. Um, but for those of you who haven't been to a webcast before, we are um, using the first few minutes of the webcast, we say 15 minutes, and sometimes we go a little longer than that, to answer questions that you all need answered. And a lot of times I really try to say to all of you, you know, we want a lot of these questions and answers to be visuals, or to be things that you need visuals of, as opposed to... Um, you know, just yes or no questions, because those can be done through email, and you can ask me those, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These, I think, we're best off to save them for when we need uh, a visual of something in order to get it, because there are sometimes guide sheets or something like that. I've had increasing, and I think it just happens with our growth, we've had increasing numbers of questions regarding non-silhouette patterns. <coughs> I won't try to address or help you all with non-silhouette patterns. I don't feel like I can. I don't feel, I mean, there's part of me that just says, look, they're not my pattern. Do it on your own. But there's a part of me that then says, you know, look, you don't even know the pattern. So I could be giving you advice that's based off how I draft a pattern, and it could com be completely wrong. And then, you know, you'd kind of say, well, this is what she told me to do. So I have to say that I will not help you on a non-silhouette item. All right, and and I'm sure I'll still get them, but I just want to kind of say that out loud so that, you know, I'll get an email and say this isn't a silhouette pattern, but no, no buts, <laughs> you know, not a silhouette pattern. Our goal is to help you with silhouette patterns. There's plenty of non-silhouette information we deal with here, um, but then I got an email that says all you ever talk about is silhouette patterns. Yep, that's true. That's all I ever talk about is silhouette patterns. <laughs> Surprise. Um, since we are silhouette patterns. But anyway, I just kind of wanted to say that, verbalize that, so that we're all on the same plane. All right? All right, questions. How do you use your French curve on your hip to get the right shape? Very easy to do, and that's a great visual. If you take a, a hip a French curve, um, there's really two hip shapes. Well, there's lots of hip shapes on a French curve, but there's two major ones, and one is going to be the more rounded edge, and one is going to be the straighter edge here. The straighter edge is the least common among women. 
it's a, it's a hip curve. I mean, and it applies to a lot, but it is the least common among uh, what we'll say real women. Most women have curvy, curvy bodies, and so they usually fall somewhere in here. So if you take this portion of the curve, and if you take a pair of pants and literally slide this up or down until it literally matches from the waist of the pant or where the waist of the pant is, it doesn't literally have to go to the waist, to the hip, and the hip is the fullest part below your waist. It's usually seven to nine inches below your waist. The French curve doesn't go below there, but it does fall between your waist and your hip. So just lay this down literally on the pant, on a pant you like, on a pant you wear. Slide it up and down until it aligns and then pick up the numbers where they start at the waist and where they go to the hip. And then those numbers should always repeat themselves with anything, any pattern, anything you're making, anything that goes from the waist and the hip that shape of the French curve should duplicate it. A French curve, or the shape of you is genetic, it's not fat driven, so you can gain a whole lot of weight and still keep the same numbers, and you can lose a whole lot of weight and still keep the same numbers. They might vary a little bit, but, but this is not about fat, this is just the shape of your body and genetics. Okay, does that help? All right. When fusing shears, netting, or lace type fabrics to make them more opaque, does the glue seep through? No. There's just not that much glue on the fusible interfacing. It's, it's just, it's a great interfacing, but it's very lightweight. I have fused things you, that were sheer, and you couldn't even see the fusible behind it at all. So, uh, not to worry about that. How do you store your patterns? I want to be able to use mine without having to unpack all the tissue every time. I want to swap out a sleeve or change a neckline. I do not blame you, and I think it's a whole harder game when you all deal with this whole tissue thing. Um, I'm going to just reach over here and grab this because this is how I store my patterns. And I had a lady, I took this to a workshop one time, she goes, oh, I got to have those, you know. Um, so even if they were on tissue, you could still punch a hole through them and put them on a hanger. They don't need to have them on here, but I actually have a closet in my house and all of my patterns are in that closet um, numerically is how I do them. I don't have any non-silhouette patterns in my house so um, I only have silhouette patterns so that's how I store mine. Uh, they just have the pattern number on the front and then all the pieces that are um, used for that pattern. Now as an example like I y'all are familiar with 1950. 1950 was our pattern of the month for January and then 1750 was our pattern of the month for February. Those sleeves are very similar. They're not exact, but they're very similar. I actually have the same sleeve copied onto this hanger. So this has this is a complete pattern. Even though it's the same as 1750 or, or very similar, I still repeat the sleeve. So I don't have to go to the 1750 hanger to get the sleeve from that hanger. Um, I, I find it easy enough to duplicate the hanger. For those of you who are tracing your patterns, you could simply trace your pattern onto like a paper. This is just like a um, a lightweight office paper, of, you know, a copy paper of any kind. So you could trace them off and then pierce a hole and then hang them, but this is how I do it. And I think this is really easy because I walk into the closet and pick out the pattern I need. It's very, very easy. They, they do get, you know, a little worn and a little well used but I don't really use the tissue. I don't use the tissue. I don't know how many of you use tissue, but I'm finding by asking questions that fewer and fewer of you actually use the tissue. A lot of you actually use uh, or trace them off. In one of your sheath dress webcasts, you said that you don't recommend using leather piping because of the washing. Do you still feel that way? No, I don't remember saying that. If I said it, it was a while ago and the piping couldn't be washed or maybe the producer told me to say that because they don't want people to think, you know, erroneous information. But I actually do wash my leather piping and it can be washed. So you can. Um, what, let me ask that question just one second. I have a, um, a suede jacket that I got goop on and I decided to wash. It's fairly new. I hadn't made it that long ago and I literally threw it in the washer 
threw it in the dryer, it turned out beautiful. I mean, it really turned out beautiful. Took a suede brush, just kind of brushed the suede. It's really beautiful. Um, where can I find good leather piping? And how much? How much is the piping? Is that the question? Where can I find good leather piping? I think the easiest source is Leather Impact. It's in New York. Um, I honestly don't know how much it is because I just say I want five yards and they always give me a discount so I hate asking because it's not necessary. I don't know how much it costs. Also there's a place in Atlanta if you all are in the Atlanta area at all, Gale K's and they have leather piping. Um, leather Impact will mail. They'll, they've got a website. They'll, you, know, you can look. They've got all kinds of, you know, it's, it's endless. But I, I would trust either of those two sources. How would I deepen the French dart on the sweater set? Um, I think that answers your own question. Deepen just means take up more, just increase it on both sides. So if a French dart is literally, if those open lines right there represent the seam allowance, then I would just go equal distance on both sides of that French dart. Just take it up more, so a larger dart. You don't have to change the point of the dart. Um, and then whatever you take up, let's say if you take up a half an inch on each side, then you add the half inch that you took up on this side and the half inch that you took up on this side because you made the garment one inch shorter, and then you add one inch to the bottom of the garment, taper to nothing at center front, and the side seams will still align with each other. Okay. If I want to increase the waist circumference to allow for a bigger tummy, do I add width to the side seam? Um, in general, I'm going to say yes. You know, it, there could be a princess seam. There could be, um, it, it, is it, okay, and if I then want to add, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> if I then want to add a second waist dart, do I add dart to the side seam as well? Yes, you just, I mean, there's a limit to moving around all this stuff. What you want to do is you're trying to keep the garment looking vertical. So center front is always straight. You can't add to center front, and the reason you can't is because it's center front, straight of grain. And we want the body to appear to be straight. So all the adding and subtracting is done through the side seam. But there is a, a ratio and a balance to where if you add so much at the side to take in darts at the waist, or I, you know, so I don't know how much you're asking. Um, at some point you want to you're going to want to split up the middle, open up the middle, so that the side seam doesn't become really biased. All right, so there's kind of some parameters so that you'll know my concerns. My concerns are that uh, if you just keep adding to the side seam, that that side seam will become biased enough that it becomes unstable, and you don't want that, or becomes uh, not as stable as you want it to be. Okay? All right. Would a crepe material work well for Sheila's jacket? or too lightweight. I want a copy of Tahari jacket and crepe. I don't think it'd be too lightweight at all. We're going to actually talk about all these different kinds of fabrics um, and I'll, you can kind of get an idea. I'll describe the fabric so you can get an idea as to what you can do out of Sheila's jacket and the, um, the freedom you have. I think you've got a lot of freedom. You'll see you have a lot of freedom tonight. On Sally's pant, I need to make the thigh area narrower. Are there any rules like needing to take in the same amount at the inseam as the outseam? There are not. Just take it out of the outseam. But again, it depends on how much you're taking away. Um, you know, if you're draping a pair of pants, and let's say you want to take out two inches, an inch on the side, an inch in the front, an inch in the back, not a big deal. If you're feeling like you want to take more than that, then you're really better off to cut the size hip you need and then cut the size leg you need and, and, and do both the same size on the inseam as the outseam so that the leg is a little more balanced. You can simply take out from the outseam and it won't be a problem. But you can't take that equal amount from the inseam because um, you're cutting, you know, a crotch comes out and then goes up. If you take out the inseam, you're, you're the body depth, you're minusing out the body depth, that, that doesn't work. So you can't do that. But just take it out of the outseam. I, I don't think it should be a problem. They're not that big, so I wouldn't think the amount you're taking out would be significant. Okay. If a yoga pant is too loose in the thigh, should I use the Me Too pattern? Um, so I can assume the smallest yoga pant is too large in, this, in the thigh. 
um, I don't think you need to use the Me Too pattern. I would just simply decide um, how much smaller you want it. You guys, you always have a place where you're at and a place you want to be. Instead of just kind of randomly saying, I want to take away, uh, you know, you got to have an, or you should, you don't have to, but you should have an idea as to where you want to be. Okay, so I know where you are, you're at the pattern, but where do you want to be? You want to take out. How much do you want to take out? The thigh's too big. How much too big? In between here, there's a standard as to what you like. What is that standard, and how does it compare with where you are? And is that where you want to be? There's the different fabrics, and so do you need to make it a little bit more? So instead of the questions, and the questions are fine, I'm not criticizing them, but they're so generic that you're thinking generically. I don't care, I don't have a problem with the questions being generic, but what it means is you're thinking generically, and we need to think more specifically so that we'll be able to answer the question more specifically. So if I'm at a thigh that is 30 inches and I want to be at 28 inches, can I take it off just the out seam? Well, two inches, yes, absolutely, you can take that out. You, you, so you understand what I'm saying. What I would do then is if the yoga pant is too large for the thigh and you're trying to get to a smaller size, how much smaller? What is the size that you're at and what is the size you want to be to? Because what I would say is if you look at that yoga pant, you've got sizes 18, 16, 14, you know, it goes da, 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 all the way down to size whatever it is, 4. So if that size 4 is too large in the leg circumference, then say, okay, I want to be 1 inch smaller and then go up one inch, say, so, so let's say from the size 4 to the size 10 is an inch of difference, then all you have to do is go down that same amount but 4 going down. So look at the 4, look at the 10 and go down that same amount and you can create your own smaller size rather than going to a Me Too selection. There's really no reason to go to the Me Too, there's no, no reason to buy another pattern. Um, I wouldn't find that as the suggestion. I think you've got all those sizes in there. You've got the gradation of all those sizes from small to large. So you have to decide how much smaller you want it and grade it down to that size and then you're good to go. It doesn't mean you have to grade down the top. You can leave the top bigger and just grade down the leg and use your French curve to connect the two in between those. Okay? Okay. Are we good? All right. Good. Very good questions. But again, I think because of our... I, I think... Um, that because our teaching has been generic, our thinking is generic. And our thinking has to become more specific. If you go back to a few years ago when, or, you know, I mean, we're 17 years old now. we got to change the website because we got to update it. We're an we had another birthday. So 17 years ago, when I started teaching finished garment measurements, I mean, y'all looked at me like I was, you know, some crazy woman, literally some crazy woman from outer whatever. And now you get that you can't possibly have success without having finished garment measurements. You can't have body measurements. You never know what the garment's going to be. So it's still a new concept to us, <laughs> even though I've been saying it for 17 years. It's still new information. It's, we're, still, we're still struggling with processing that information, which is interesting to me. But again, I think it's just because we did it for so long, for so wrong, et cetera, et cetera that we're still having a hard time turning the boat. Just say turn the boat and make a list of all the things, all the measurements that you like finished. Your thighs and your pants, your thighs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? All right. All right, so let's talk Sheila's jacket. Pattern number 1819 is our pattern of the month. Um, and it is, uh, I think March is through a week from today. Ne March ends a week from today, the 31st, so you have another seven days to buy it and we'll end it on the 1st. The 31st will be the last day. Um, the reason I've kind of, I have tried to carefully lead you down a path that will give you confidence in making jackets because I think I have heard from a lot of you that com the only thing you're lacking in making jackets is confidence. You have the fabric, you have the pattern, you have plenty of fabric, you just need the confidence. Many of you have had that confidence. I've been really, really excited to see many of you send pictures and post pictures of a completed jacket, and that's thrilling. So I started off with 1950 in January. 1950 was Max's jacket. It was a really six or seven piece jacket, no separate collars, shawl collar, very simple, lined, but it had lining, and that lining kind of threw some of you, but you worked your way through it you got there. Then we went to 1750, 1750 again, shawl collar, simpler, even a little simpler um, because it had no lining all of a sudden. Now we're going to um, 1819 and so all of these have a jacket feel but they just get simpler. Now why did I start 
why didn't I start the other way? <laughs> because I was afraid you'd not go into the lining. But then uh, the new year and the vigor and the vim and I can do this, I figured lining was great to start with at that point. So let me just tell you a little bit about 1819. 1819, um, the original was an Armani, very simple $1,800 little jacket that I looked at, tried on, and thought this can't possibly cost this much money. It's just too simple. Now, don't get me wrong, part of it was the fabric, and I'm going to share with you kind of the fabrics, and then I'm going to share with you different ways that I've done this because it is, Sheila's jacket is um, four pieces. Oh, sorry, four pieces. There's four pieces to this pattern, and two of them are the sleeve. So that means there's just one front and one back. You know, come on. That's like the sweater set almost, you guys. It's that easy. So this is something you can do and, and you can play with and you can really use this simple little jacket. It's unlined. There's no lining to it. Again, I did some variations. I did do some um, facings and I'll show you why and et cetera, et cetera. But I want to first show you this fabric. And this is a fabric I just picked up because I'm always looking for this kind of fabric. And it is just simply a, it could be a boiled wool, it can be a double-faced wool. If any I say any of those names, what you understand is there's really no difference between the front and the back of the fabric. You couldn't tell the front and the back if you had to, but you don't have to. That's the good news. So it was just simply a double-faced fabric, no finishes on the edges at all, nothing. Just literally cut straight and left. No pipe, no nothing just cut straight and left. So you understand when I looked at it, when I felt it, the beauty was in the fit. So I'm going to talk to you about all that tonight so that you can get the fit exactly where you want it to be. Um, but again, we'll talk about more kinds of fabrics, but I'm going to leave this kind of fabric right here for just a minute because you're going to see me making this jacket. It's a great jacket. Um, this Sheila's jacket I changed from the original. Armani actually did not have a dart at all. There was no darting. And, you know, that's great. And, you know, I know you know some designers design for just straighter, flatter bodies. Armani is one of them. He doesn't design for a real busty woman, um, clearly because his clothes have no bust and darts built into them. So it's not what he's going for. But this French dart many of you have French darts, you know French darts, you know they're very simple to sew and you know that there's no hot lengthening or shortening of the bust dart. You simply stop stitching earlier or you keep stitching farther if you want that dart to raise or lower. So we can't screw up that bust dart, that's not going to be a difficult thing for us. Um, the back does not have darts, the back is cut on the full, there's no center back seam. Um, I did add darts in several occasions. I did add darts. I'll show you where. So the only thing we need to check is, is the angle of the shoulder correct? It's the same angle as 1950, 1750, except this does not have a shoulder pad. So it, that, that means the armhole's a slight bit smaller and there is no shoulder pad on this. So you're going to get a little different arch of the shoulder because there's no shoulder pad to pick it up. Okay, so I'm going to bring you in this first version here. And this I did pretty much I think just like the pattern but I want to kind of explain to you how this works here. Um, this is how it's pictured on the front of the pattern and the edge I used the selvage in this case and I took the, this is a denim it's a two-sided denim um, or I don't know I guess all, all denim is two-sided if you like both sides but this particularly I, I really like both sides and it had a great selvage so um, I, I wanted this side is sewn, this side I left, and I wanted to undo it so you could see that that is the way that it actually folds back. And I've made it numerous times and actually left it open like that, and left it no like little lapel. The lapel is literally created by simply the fold of the fabric and taking like a little dart, um, you know, right there at the top and then literally stitching it in place. But certainly you could. Um, put a button higher. You could do all kinds of things to this if you just make sure the circumference is adequate for you and so you can just measure your bust and know that you need an adequate circumference. I wanted a vest look or kind of like a vest look. I wanted this little jean jacket to go over things. I wanted it to be long enough to go over leggings so I made it longer so that it completely closes up. Uh, the buckle on this one is just a little tiny ring 
um, on this this side I'll undo this here so you can kind of see what I did I just took a long piece of the selvage literally I, I went in in just a little bit just like you would a button and just stitch down the middle so that as it closes and this ring comes over one side goes through the ring and then of course it can just be tied could be tied in a bow could, you know whatever you want to finish it off if you want to close the jacket or it's easy enough that you could leave it open if you wanted okay so I in general if you'll notice and look at the difference with the two lapels a narrower lapel has a tendency to make you look thinner it's a, it it takes on a more vertical line whereas once they're open or left not stitched it has a little bit more of a hor horizontal feel but keep in mind and I'll sh we'll go over this too I can shape these however I want to and I don't have to make them this wide I certainly could keep them narrower I also chose this jacket because it's a shawl collar so we've had shawl collars now January February and March the good news is y'all are getting very good at shawl collars they're very easy what you learn about them is they don't have to be perfect they're they're just real simple to sew as you're making one seam that comes across the shoulder the collar is being sewn to the back and then across the other side very quick and easy too okay so the French dart is there in place you don't even see it and then of course I put two darts in the back I'm gonna remind you that when you put darts in the back I did it because the fabric I felt like just needed a little bit more direction and when you put darts in the back boy it just really slims you up I didn't do it in the original pattern because I don't know why I didn't do it but you can add them in darts are four inches from center back so all you have to do is mark the center back first go four inches from each side up and down okay so I want to just take a minute and ask questions about this one in particular again when you're doing this jacket I in my mind see this as a fairly simple jacket with really your pop of color underneath it's the color underneath that you're kinda of going for in my mind your jacket is really just a um, almost like a a canvas for that little pop of color underneath and that doesn't mean it shouldn't be interesting to have great closures and all that kinda of stuff but um, I I find that I usually pick fairly simple colors or fairly simple fabrics because I want the underneath to kind of do all the talking. Okay. Okay. Which type of jacket should I measure for your size? That's a really good question because if I do this, ja this jacket can change if I do it in a short sleeve or if I do it in a long sleeve if I do it in a short sleeve it really does become like a vest and I'd want it much closer to my physical body size than if I go to do it with a longer sleeve so if I do it like a longer sleeve you would do the same measurement as any other jacket if I go to do it with a shorter sleeve then it mimics more a vest and I would go down a little bit size I would go down smaller okay so your your choice of short sleeve or long sleeve is what's going to determine more so a size than the actual jacket itself but any jacket you wear would be the same as this it wouldn't change up any other way and of course depending on what you want to wear under it etc etc I like this type of sleeve because I can wear it with a long sleeve underneath and it looks like a little vest kind of in the spring or as it warms up in the summer I can wear it with a tank underneath and I've still got a little bit of sleeve so I really like this sleeve I think it's a real versatile sleeve and all, all it is is oh it's maybe like six inches here and then it's like one inch underneath and then you can connect the two so it's not a lot of sleeve at all okay any other questions from here I want to show you another version okay so again the advantage of seeing all these ver all these different versions in my mind the reason I do them is number one um, again at silhouette patterns the goal initially was to there were six patterns those six patterns were going to be you know sold as a set and you all were gonna buy those set and be happy ever after so the goal was not to have a hundred and something patterns now I understand why we have a hundred I understand why you know I understand why that's happened but I still believe that when you buy a pattern you I think you would benefit most from that pattern if you see the variations that are possible with it um, so that you can change it up and make it personal you et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. remember we talked about shawl collars and one thing that we've talked about shawl collars is shawl collars lend themselves to um, curved fabrics 
in general because the shawl collars are curved. Now, what I liked about this Armani is you notice it's a shawl collar, but it is a notch lapel. Even though it's not a real notch lapel, it's a fake notch lapel. But I really liked that kind of contradiction that was there. So I had a thought of taking, I had a fabric, and I'll show you this fabric first. Um, this fabric is a Pontaroma knit, and I really like it. Um, I don't have it to sell. I really liked it. And it's a charcoal gray, and on the Pontaroma, I don't know if you can see it, but there's little circles. So when I first found the fabric, I thought, oh, that's just going to be perfect because it's plain on one side and it's got circles on the other side. So I thought I'll make the jacket plain and then make it flip back to see the circles. Um, and I don't know, for some reason as I got to working with it, I just decided that I didn't want that. I just didn't want it. <laughs> you know, we're women. We don't have to have reasons why. I just didn't want that. So I decided then what I would do is I would create a facing for the jacket. I still want to do the same jacket and I'll show you why but I would create a facing for this jacket. I absolutely love this jacket. I just, I mean, I love the way it fits. I love the, I, I just really love it. So I, I really kind of wanted to make what I call a little swing jacket. So I wanted it to be bigger at the bottom. So I added some fullness to the bottom. I'll talk about how much. Um, and here I've added in a facing. So this is the same collar. I know you look at that and say, that's the same collar. Um, all I did was, and I think whenever I do these changes, I'm always, I'm always into making them just simple. So all I did was, here's the pattern piece, and you can see where it goes out there to form that notch. All I did was take, and if you can see, I'm connecting my French curve here and here, and all I'm doing is cutting off that little, gosh, what is it, two square inches of pattern tissue? That's all I'm doing is, is literally rounding that out. So when you do that, what you get is this really beautiful shawl collar. Right, so again, because I wanted it to just have a little more body, I went ahead and doubled the whole entire front. After I did that, and then I rounded out the bottom here also because I just wanted it to be conducive. The bottom is normally rectangular. Um, so curved here, curved here. Um, and then I cut that twice. So instead of only cutting two fronts, I cut four fronts. Literally, I just sewed them all together, turned them to the inside, did French darts in both, and then sewed them in at the side seam, shoulder seams, the sleeves. So literally, I just doubled the whole front. The fabric is light enough that it's not heavy at all. I didn't use any interfacing. It's got a beautiful shawl collar to it. I love it with this color. I love it with the collar. Love everything about it. Let me show you the back. So the back has a little bit of swing to it, a little swing feeling to it, and I added a pleat in the back. So that pleat in the back, um, my pleat is two inches. So you just take the back of the tissue, anytime you're gonna add a pleat, no matter where you're gonna add a pleat, and just come out an inch and then go all the way down. Remember an inch doubles itself, and so an inch will be two inches. And then when you go to stitch it, you stitch it on the original line, and then you just stop stitching where you want the pleat to open. And I wanted that pleat to open right in there. And so I, that's just as simple it as it is. Now what I did though is I added two inches to the bottom at the back. I added one inch to the side at both the front and the back. And then I left this the same in the front. So that the front has a, ca a little cascade that goes to the back. There's a two inch difference that the back is longer than the front and I just did the sleeve, a three-quarter sleeve, and then I just put one of our little gunmetal class fasteners in the front, and you will be seeing me wear this because I just, I love the way it fits. It's still, even though it's a little bit of a swing jacket in the back, it still has a really nice shaping to it. That French dart has a beautiful little waist curve to it, and it's really, really nice. So again, the collar is still the same collar. It just Instead of making my little notch lapel there, I just curved it and made a nice shawl. And I did that based on the fabric. So that's where when you see a fabric and, and you can say, oh, that'd be perfect for that jacket, but curves and curves. Remember curves and curves for the most part. I mean, you know, obviously it's not all the way across the board, but for the most part, remember curves and curves. 
Okay, any questions about this particular jacket? This is the time to ask, not next week. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. I just think that these are really simple changes to do, but I really, I think there's a big difference between these two jackets. When you look at the two of them, you know, would you think that they're the same pattern? I mean, yeah, they're both jackets, but I think there's a lot of difference between the two. Okay. All right, so that brings us to our jacket that we have here. Um, this I did out of a shirting fabric. Now, the beauty of the shirting fabric, now remember when we go to men's shirting, men's shirting, and really why it's usually called men's shirting is because it's both sides are usable. And the way men's shirts are made is that the facing is not meant to cover the wrong side of the fabric. With women's shirting, a lot of times the facing goes up into the shoulder so that when the blouse is worn open, only the right side shows. But with men's shirts, the fabric is dual-sided and it's many times hard to tell the front side from the back side. But when you get into some really beautiful shirtings, and this is definitely one of them, this is a Xenia, the front and back have different views and they're just this is beautiful this black and white to me is just stunning it's so beautiful so I decided to use this um, in creating what I wanted to do next and what I wanted to do next and many of you I've gotten so many emails and women have said I want to make pattern number 211 it's 9 is top and you guys know it's like my ridiculous favorite pattern um, I want to make 911 or 211 but I want to make it in a woven and I'm like, no, you can't do that. You can't move. Or, you know, if you want to do it, you've got to figure out an armhole and a sleeve, and that's going to be different than what's in the pattern. So you all know the differences. So what I did in this case is I took Nina's, because to me, I said it earlier, this is kind of like a sweater set. It's only got a front and a back and a sleeve. It's got two-piece sleeve to give it a little more direction, but it still doesn't have a lot of pattern pieces, and it has a French dart. But it's a jacket. What makes it a jacket is because it's got a larger armhole. It's got still the ease in the sleeve so that that ease is still set in with tie interfacing. And what that ease does is it gives it a, big, a bigger sleeve circumference. And that sleeve circumference, the larger sleeve circumference, allows a greater mobility than what a blouse does or what a, um, a knit does. So this can be definitely done in a woven. And I decided that I wanted to do it in the 211. So I took the 211 pattern. Remember that it is, it's not a shawl collar, it's a, uh, it's got a collar added on. But I decided to leave it as a shawl collar. All I used the 211 for was to figure out how much fullness I wanted to add in the front. So I just followed that neckline, the styling of it, and then I brought it right back down into the waist. So the fullness is not um, all the way to the bottom. It could be. I just decided in this case that I didn't want that much fullness because it was fashion fabric. And then I just found a wonderful trim. Um, it was all black and white, but gosh, I could have gotten a green trim, a yellow trim. Lots of great colors out there would have been terrific. And for me, in general, I buy trims over <laughs> fabric because great trims are really hard to find. Great fabrics are not as hard to find to me as great trims. Great trims are you know, really wonderful. So you can see I just really used the effect of the black and white. So I did the rolled cuff because again I wanted that black and white to show so that's simply the wrong side of the fabric and I did I cut a full length sleeve and then rolled it up several times so that I would get a quarter length sleeve. Um, I'm not going to have any closure on it. I'm simply going to, I've closed it up here just so you could see the difference. But I'm just literally it's a very lightweight jacket. It's it's kind of like a blouse. Here in the back is where I'm showing you that I did the darts. I mean, I did it on the other one too, but find the center back, go four inches to each side, and then go ahead and draw in those darts and sew them in. Okay, so really easy to do, and yet you've got shaping in the back, you've got a beautiful shape in the back, and you've got a really loose flowy front that gives you a much different look from this same jacket. But keep in mind that I'm looking for fabrics that are one layer, really simple, really light, really easy, and yet it's still an extra layer on there, and it's a great, it's a great look. I don't think so. I think I did it, you know, it's really funny because this was all done three weeks ago, or whenever it was. 
two weeks ago it was all done and so when I start thinking about what did I do or it's harder for me to remember two weeks ago if something I did than usually when I'm finishing it three days before or something like that um, I don't think so I think I cut it exactly yeah I cut it exactly by the pattern there's no I didn't shorten or lengthen it either one um, and I didn't the gray uh, this one I lengthened I didn't shorten any of them I didn't shorten any of them I lengthened the jean and the other two I did the same length as the pattern. The pattern cover is not lengthened, no. No, it's done. You know, I shouldn't say that. I don't remember. The original though, I don't think we had, I don't think, usually when I make a pattern cover I would just make it exactly like the pattern. You know, I've gotten um, a little more liberated in these days, being a little more careful. In the early days, I was, um, I'd was i make a change on the pattern and then, because I didn't think it was a big deal, and then I would get, well, it's not in the pattern how to do this. And so I realized I backed off that. So I'm much more careful now to make the envelope match exactly what's in, not with any little change at all. Okay, so how are we doing on changes? See what jacket? Oh, the circle jacket, okay. Would I get in trouble if I put this on? This is so cute on, you guys. I'm going to put this on. It's an, I haven't got the right top on. Um, yeah, they're wrong sides together inside. Here's the inside. Now let me just show you something about this pleat. This is I learned a long time ago. When you go to do a pleat, the pleat, even though if you look on this side, the pleat only shows from like the waist down. When you actually go to do a pleat, more expensive garments or better gar better made garments, the pleat is actually the whole entire way to the neck because the neckline supports the pleat and the pleat hangs better. So in the old days, um, they used to when they made garments they would make that pleat all the way you know if it was a uh, if it was like at the back of a skirt they would make it go all the way to the waist etc cetera, etc cetera. I guess you shouldn't layer this stuff <laughs> but anyway um, I think I learned in another webcast not to do this because <laughs> I could I never could get it off but um, so when you take that pleat and you go all the way up with it it's really a, I think the whole garment has a tendency to hang a little bit better because of that, um, because that pleat goes all the way up there. It's got more support than it just being halfway through the garment, if that makes sense. So I definitely don't have the right undergarments with it, but you see where, it doesn't look terrible. <laughs> oh, sorry. See, I should never do this. I know better. I know better, but it's really cute, and I'll show you the back, because the back really has just a real fun hang to it. But it's it still has shape to it, but it's just not so big, but it's got a cute little f flare that goes down, etc., etc. Anyway. This side. The Nina's top is, is this way, and then I just pulled it right back into the waist. You could have added it all the way to the hem. If You know, that's all styling. But I decided I really wanted, when I was thinking about where did I want the fullness, I really wanted the fullness just right in here. I didn't want the fullness down at the hip line area. So I added across and then cut it out down to the waist so that the fullness just hangs in this section right here. This part fits just like it, it would without adding anything. Yeah, I'll take it off because I think you can see it and I'll be careful not to. Okay, so here's just a real cute little pleat back there. So I'll go to the inside and you can see right there at center back, if I just hold it out. Now the center back of this pattern is on a fold. 
So there's the amount that I added. And that, if I measure it, I did mine, how many measures? Two inches. Here, I've got my French curve, just a second. No, it measures an inch and five-eighths. So an inch and five-eighths wide is how much I added all the way down. So just take the center back and move it away from the fold an inch and five-eighths and just add that through. Then sew right on the center back seam. It's on the fold. So if there was a seam there, you want to stitch on that seam and you want to stitch down until you want the pleat to stop. So I just stitched right down to here and then back stitched. And I did it about the waist area. So I stopped stitching from the bottom of the jacket. Of course, I had a little bit of length in the back. Remember that? Mine's about 13 inches from the bottom of the jacket. Then you just open it up and press. And you don't even see any of this because it's, it's sewn. But where you stop stitching, you have a little box pleat here. Normally on jackets, you have to stitch that horizontally. You don't have to stitch that because the pleat is supported all the way up by the back of the neck. So that's why this is such a nicer way to make a pleat than to just, you know, a lot of patterns, they just have the back and then they have that little box that comes down and then goes over. But when you have that, then it has to be stitched because otherwise it won't support itself. But this is all supported by up here. And so that it, it really, the pleat hangs so much prettier than if you just have that little vent thing cut out. I mean, even in skirts, if you do it that way, it's a lot nicer. Okay? Does that help? Everybody got that? It is. It's really pretty. It's, it's very soft, um, but it's really a nice little addition. And you can really do it to any jacket. It's not limited to, uh, again, I just wanted the back and I wanted it soft and flowy a little bit rather than fitted. And so I curved the back and then added that pleat and the combination of those two is really nice. No, no shoulder pads. Nope, I didn't put shoulder pads in 18, 19 at all. We've had shoulder pads in 1950. You all think I'm the shoulder pad queen and it's so not true. I've got to change my reputation. Shoulder pads are wonderful. There's a time and a place, but they don't need to be in everything and there's certainly lots of jackets that we can wear without them. It wouldn't hurt to put shoulder pads in these if you really had um, either a really rounded shoulder, if you had a really sloped shoulder. Shoulder pads make us look thinner. For the most part, we look thinner and we look younger with shoulder pads. Um, so they're not a bad thing, but you don't feel like you have to have them unless you want them. Then if you want them, there's nothing wrong with putting them in. Okay. How do you add the selvage on the denim jacket? Um, in general, when I'm dealing with a selvage, and I personally love selvage. And, you know, I mean, it should just be a habit for all of us as sewers that we always notice the selvage because, again, I think it's just because I love beautiful trims. There's a trim, and it's not only is it free, it's built into my fabric already. It, it coordinates, it matches, et cetera, et cetera. So I think as a general habit, it's a great idea to just watch for selvages. So immediately, for me, when I look at a selvage, it almost influences what I'm going to do with that fabric. Because if there's a beautiful selvage, then I'm going to incorporate it into something that needs a trim or piping. or So it, it influences me on what pattern I choose, if that makes sense. In this particular case, um, I mean, denim selvage isn't a big deal, except that it really is a very clean, nice selvage. And in this case, because denim always has a, a white weft, then it usually picks up a white trim of some kind and that's a nice accent when I'm trying to create a vertical line. So all I did was cut off the selvage, I surged it, so this selvage I cut was an inch wide, I trimmed it to just kind of clean up the raw edge with a black serge thread, I just did a four thread serge, and then I literally just put it on top and top stitched. And I top stitched on the um, serge side, and then I top stitched close to the edge here to kind of keep it down so that it wouldn't. When it came to the lapel, I literally went off and then put the vertical um, on top. The only thing I would say, just silly, silly little thing comes into this, is because again you want a vertical look, you have to overlap one of the ends. 
something has to overlap the other because you're changing directions and it's like a 90 degree angle. So I would recommend that you use the vertical to be on top. And this this is a vertical, but because it's out farther, it actually acts almost like a horizontal. So do the neckline first, and then turn it, and then do the front, and do the front. So that's all I did. The, the bottom of the jacket, um, I actually cut it on the selvage. So the only time I put selvage trim on top is when I'm, I can't cut it on the selvage when it's not straight. But because the bottom of the jacket, I could, it's straight, I actually put it on the selvage. So there's no hem to the bottom of the jacket at all. Okay, it just comes to the bottom and then I trimmed up the selvage just on the parts that weren't straight. Okay, so again, very easy because there's no hemming. And I know you all like the no hemming thing, right? Everybody likes that. Okay, tell us about my top. Um, it's a fabric that we have. It's a new fabric. I put it up last week. Um, I love it. It's 100% cotton. It's so hard to find a sweater knit these days. It's 100% cotton. And for me, I'm always burning it just because I'm sure there's something else in there and I just really liked it. So, and I'm crazy about that Sunny's Top pattern 113. I have probably made them in my sleep. It's ridiculous. But you know, you just get affixed to a pattern and you just go after it. You just keep making it. My son's looking at me like, Gosh, you could wear something different besides that top, <laughs> besides 113 and 211, you know. But I've even made them to match one another. They go together great. <laughs> um, it's, so it's number 113, and it's done, I don't remember the name of the fabric. It's um, black with white knit stripe. I mean, it's not a fancy name or anything. There's not a lot of it left. We, we've done very well with fabrics. We continue to do very well with fabrics. I did. I was very excited today. We got a lot of new fabrics up cotton stretch all last summer. I mean, I I literally covered the globe trying to find cotton stretch fabrics to do like colored denim. Now this is not as heavy as a denim, but it's perfect for summer weight colored denims. If you want to do teal jeans or capris, it's so cute. We've got eight different colors, um, khaki, but it's 100% cotton woven stretch it's really really nice I was so excited I probably bought way too much but anyway we'll see it's really great stuff and it's so hard like I said to find 100% cotton it's always poly blend and it's yucky feeling and this is really soft I burned it it burns beautiful there's not any tiny bit of resistance left at all it's just got this beautiful little cotton ash to it so it's ridiculous when you start getting excited about how beautiful something burns anyway so what else can we tell you? We got a few minutes left. Next, next time, two weeks from now, we'll we'll be back on our regular schedule. I was gonna just do two in a row, but I guess my <laughs> illness took care of that. I want to do spring blouses. We've got some beautiful fabrics. Um, pattern number three fifty is Stephanie's blouse is going to be our pattern of the month for April. My logic on this is y'all have done great on jackets. Still don't pass this Sheila's jacket up. It's so quick and easy to make. You know, I mean, I think I was so ready for the webcast because it was so easy to make these as opposed to making line jackets, which take more time. This is a really fun, simple jacket to make. Make it shorter, make it, you know, there's just so many different options with it. This is a kimono sleeve, and so the reason I picked this pattern is I really want us to understand kimono sleeves. There's negatives and positives to them, so I kind of want to explore. So next time what we'll do, the first time, we'll spend talking about the fit, depending on how much we get done. But I really, I would really challenge you guys. We have a pattern of the month club, so lots of you are just going to get the pattern automatically. But if you have a challenge with blouses at all, get the muslin made. We've got two weeks. Get the pattern, get the muslin made, because when you have a set-in sleeve, that seam has a job to do, and the job is to take away that extra fabric that's in between the um, bust and the sleeve. You don't have that in a kimono. It's all one. But there's so many great tricks that you can do to make that blouse fit beautiful, and it's such a nice style variation than always having a set-in sleeve. So it's a beautiful um, blouse. Again, lots of options. We're going to see making it, but next time we'll cover the fit for spring blouses, okay? 
So 350 Stephanie's Blast will be our pattern of the month for May. Okay, so we are at close. We will have a bonus question because we always have a bonus question. We want to thank you all for watching. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I can say thank you, thank you. I had many, many um, get well wishes and I appreciate them. Um, I had enough to where I quit answering them because I had to get my work done. <laughs> but I don't not appreciate them. Thank you. I really do uh, appreciate all the thoughts. Okay, so we're not ready yet. We're not ready. My crew behind me says not yet. You guys, before we before we ask this, we have had so much fun at Puyallup. I mean, you guys hear the webcast and you you hear the emails, but you don't necessarily hear the follow through. It was wonderful. It was so nice. It was so much fun. I, I can, I, I don't know, maybe it was the most fun I've ever had at Puyallup because we didn't lug in a ton of product. It was by far the easiest show we've ever done. We definitely took a lot of customers by surprise because we weren't selling anything and they just couldn't figure that one out. Um, but we will continue to do it that way. We, we, it was by far the best possible thing we could have done. Um, we appreciate all of you who are very patient in getting orders. We're current on our orders. Everything's caught up. It's wonderful. Um, we followed that right behind the next week, ETA Dallas. We had more out-of-town people at ETA Dallas than we've ever had. We had a wonderful show. Thank you all so much. Um, we followed that up with a workshop in Atlanta, which you can see by that end I was dead and dragging on the road. Um, but the three-day workshop was really wonderful, and it, it really, I don't think at this point it was food poisoning. In retro, I think that it was, a, well, the doctor feels like it was a virus. It was a stomach virus, and it was uh, knocked me on my rear end stomach virus. So it's really taken a toll on us, And but it's okay. That means I'm a little stronger now because... Well, that's not true. It's not a, it was a virus. But anyway, um, ETA DC is coming up the first part of May, May. DC is a real easy city to get to along that east coast. You've got trains. Everything goes to DC. And look on the website. That's the first week of May. And again, we're just going to have a wonderful show. It's so fun to see you all, to visit with you, um, to see what you're making, to just get together as sewers. It's really great. And um, Brett was there, and it was really fun to have him there. He really enjoys you all. He gets way more attention than I do. Um, you know, I could probably count me out. He's, he, I, I was told he's much better looking than I am. I got that. But every day in um, Puyallup, this lady brought him by chocolates. <laughs> I'd come back to the booth and I'd say, oh, yummy, who's, who's that for? And he goes, no, those are mine. <laughs> I didn't get any chocolates. But anyway, he got chocolates. So thank you all. We really appreciate that. And it was, again, good to see all of you as we traveled along. New York is in a, about three weeks. New York fabric buying trip. You will not ever find better fabric at better prices than what you will. If you're contemplating, get on, sign up. Let's do it. You can get a discount fare to, to Newark, and we'll take care of the rest. Okay, so our bonus question is, uh, what was officially the first day of spring for 2014? the actual date. We got it? March 20th. It was Thursday. Last Thursday. I'm not sure why I remember that date really well, but it was a pretty day here in Dallas anyway. I know there's some other bad things going on around the country, but here it was beautiful. Alright, so then we will, if you will, whoever won, who was it? Elfie? Elfie, if you'll look in your inbox, on your chat box. There'll be a code and you can use that code and it's good worth $50 of Silhouette Pattern product. Okay, so we will see you in two weeks which will be I think at like April 6th. Wow, that seems a long time from now. And we'll see you then. And until then, happy sewing you guys. Get your patterns, get your fabric. We've got beautiful fabric up, all that fun new prints. Oh my gosh, all those Italian cottons. They're just amazing. They're, they're viscose spandex is actually what they are, but boy, they feel like beautiful cottons. They're really, really nice. Anyway, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much. Good night.